It's four o'clock. Welcome everyone to the Washington History Seminar. I'm Christian Osterman. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all here and to um, uh, and to co-chair the session as um, as I usually do with my uh, co-chair, Professor Eric Arneson from George Washington University, who represents the National History Center as one of the two organizations. Um, that co-sponsor uh, this um, Washington History Seminar series. Um, the, the, uh, we are now in our ninth year of this collaborative effort, looking forward to the 10th anniversary uh, next year. We, we, just, uh, we just spent together with uh, Dane um, Kennedy, the director of the National History Center, last um, hour or so planning for the fall, and we're really excited about um, what promised to be a just terrific, terrific uh, fall lineup. Hopefully we'll have that for you uh, in, in a few weeks. Um, as always, we'd like to thank our... <laughs> a few months. A few months? <laughs> we're so anxious to get this out. It's, it's some really great stuff. So, um, um, We'd like to thank our sponsors, um, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and George Washington University's History Department, as well as a number of anonymous uh, donors who make uh, this meeting series possible. And we, of course, welcome uh, contributions from any of you in the audience. Um, details about how to donate to, the, uh, to this effort, it's really a shoestring uh, budget that we run this um, this series that have been running this series for the last um, nine years. Uh, details are on the back of the flyer that's available outside. Let me thank a couple of individuals who are really do the heavy lifting on uh, on all of this. Um, Jeff Rieger, the assistant director of the National History Center. Where are you, Jeff? Is he here? There he is. All right, <laughs> yeah, the camera. Uh, Pete Biersecker uh, on my program all the way in the back, and of course our intern Kyle Nichols, who will be helping at the Q&A session. Um, um, already pointed out uh, with appreciation, Dane Kennedy, uh, Director of the National History Center, and my last duty here is to ask all of you to quiet your mobile devices, please turn them off or put them into sleeping mode so we don't get interrupted um, in the middle of the presentation. With that, turn it over to Eric to introduce our featured speaker today. Thank you, Christian. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Sarah Igo, who received her BA from Harvard and her PhD from Princeton, and who is currently professor of history and law, as well as the director of American studies at Vanderbilt University. She is the author of the award-winning book, The Averaged American, Surveys, Citizens, and the Making of a Mass Public, which was the editor's choice selection for the New York Times and one of Slate's best books of 2007. Her latest book, The Known Citizen, A History of Privacy in Modern America, uh, is, has been widely reviewed uh, and was one of Washington Post's notable nonfiction books of 2018, and she will now be speaking about the known citizen and privacy in modern America. Sarah. Thank you. I'm going to stand up uh, so that I don't block the images here, and let me just make sure. Um, this is a long, deep room. Can you hear me in the back there? Yes. Okay. I can't see you, but I <laughs> some blurry images back there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'll say thank you to Eric for uh, the uh, invitation and that introduction, and to Christian and everybody else here on the staff uh, who pull off this seminar, uh, which I'm just really delighted to be a part of. Uh, and I'll thank all of you for coming today, because I think if it were me and uh, I were looking at the sunshine and those uh, cherry blossoms outside, I might have decided to take a walk if I didn't have to be here. So thank you for making the choice to come. Um, so I probably don't need to tell any of you uh, that privacy is a hot topic in 2019. Most of us, uh, even if it's not at the forefront of our consciousness, are well aware uh, as we move through daily life that we're subject to credit monitoring, to video surveillance, recommendation software, 
airport body scanners uh, that I just went through, uh, geolocation tracking, social media profiling, biometric identifiers, and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, I would argue that securing the boundary between one's private affairs and one's public identity has become a kind of routine task of modern citizenship. It's something that we all feel responsible for uh, and enact on a, um, you know, maybe not minute by minute, but a, a daily basis. And of course, uh, we are also treated uh, to a drumbeat of scandals and exposés uh, that keep pushing privacy to the forefront. Um, and if you're able uh, to see uh, this, it's just to suggest a few of the many uh, headlines uh, that we've um, been treated to this last year or so, uh, from the Equifax breach, which compromised some 143 million individuals' financial information, uh, to the unauthorized use of Facebook, user data uh, by a shady uh, political operative, uh, Cambridge Analytica, um, and of course, there have been ongoing, uh, continuing revelations about Facebook's leaky uh, data practices since then. Uh, two, uh, the pinpointing of the Golden State Killer um, through DNA and ancestry tracking. Um, that's the photo in the left-hand corner there. Um, and that was last April, it was about a year ago, and um, there have been uh, a whole series of cases which have gotten much less publicity um, that have been solved in similar fashion, cold cases reopened um, through similar means since then. Science, uh, the journal, reported on 13 uh, cases, such cases um, a couple of months ago, so I can only assume that there are more uh, since. So anyone in the room, I'm sure, can supply uh, other examples, um, and um, we, and it, it, what I mean uh, to say through all of these examples is uh, that we are uh, in an environment in which privacy seems self-evidently uh, a political topic, something we should be concerned with, something we should be talking about, uh, thinking about, guarding um, carefully. But the quandary uh, that we're in is much broader and deeper than today's news, of course. And um, I, as a historian um, of uh, intellectual life and cultural currents in modern America, I got really interested in how we got here. How did it uh, come to be that uh, modern Americans think so much and talk so much about privacy? Why is privacy so present, in other words, in public life? So what I sought to answer uh, in uh, beginning a history of privacy was really a simple question, or at least I thought it was a question, simple question, uh, which was why privacy uh, moved, why and when, I suppose, privacy moved right into the center of American public life. Uh, this new book uh, that I've written uh, is an attempt to chart why privacy became such a fixture, even a fixation, of US public culture. And what may be surprising um, to those of you in this room, at least it surprised me, um, was that Americans in fact did not talk about privacy very much, at least in public, uh, before the 19th century, the late 19th century, nor were privacy rights um, a, a standard vocabulary of politics. What's fascinated me as a historian trying to chart and to place privacy in political uh, and public life uh, is that so many of our privacy debates of the moment are not actually particularly new. Many of them um, echo or parallel past debates. Um, this is true of things like unauthorized information flows, virtual intrusions, uh, the profits from sales of personal data, and so on. All of these, as I'll get to in a few minutes, have long histories. Yet, Americans' uh, obsession or fixation on privacy is not age old either. Um, there was a very particular and critical moment uh, which set off our contemporary privacy debates, uh, which I would place in the late 19th century. Privacy debates in that uh, time uh, moved to the fore of American life, um, and this is really the argument of this book, um, Privacy debates moved to the fore as Americans, whether willingly or unwillingly, became known citizens. Um, for this title of this book, uh, I uh, have to credit a wonderful 1939 poem by W.H. Auden called The Unknown Citizen. 
Uh, and the poem, of which only a little piece is reproduced here, um, the poem details an array of agencies uh, that presume to know the anonymous individual uh, at its uh, heart. Um, this man's uh, union, his hospital, his schools, his insurers, marketers, journalists, pollsters, statisticians, everybody knows this man. Uh, but then Auden asks at the end of the poem, was he free, was he happy? The question is absurd. Had anything been wrong, we should certainly have heard. Um, so it's a really a, a beautiful, um, I think, poem about the hubris, but also about the uh, uncertainty of what we know about one another, and yet also the modern quest to know uh, individuals uh, more and more intimately, uh, more thoroughly than they are presumed sometimes even to know themselves. So Auden's poem uh, took me on a kind of journey because it focuses on us on something beyond the major scandals uh, that I began with, those scandals that grab headlines and spark outrage, uh, no matter how uh, you know, temporarily uh, they do that. Uh, and the poem uh, and Auden's words, um, this idea of a known or unknown citizen, focus us instead on um, the society that we live in, democratic, of course, but also capitalist and information hungry a society that emerged in the United States really in the last century and has produced, I think, um, the vast majority of our privacy debates. Many of our current dilemmas uh, stem from the recognition that we increasingly live in a knowing society, one that seeks to govern, understand, and minister to its members by scrutinizing them in fuller and finer detail. So um, Auden's unknown citizen, in my mind, became the known citizen and trying to track uh, this character through modern American history. In the 20th century, of course, uh, Americans became known in peculiarly modern fashion by state bureaucracies and law enforcement. Uh, those are sometimes the examples maybe we go uh, to first. But they also uh, became known in new fashion by the popular press, by advertisers and marketers, a whole host of private uh, agencies. Uh, by private corporations, financial institutions uh, like credit bureaus, by scientific researchers and medical experts of all sorts, by their own workplaces and schools, and most recently by data aggregators and proprietary algorithms. Now, uh, this was not necessarily a sinister or coordinated effort. In fact, I would say most of the time it was not. Um, the Americans became known in all of these new ways, uh, often because of the benefits or the convenience or the safety that being known offered. Um, I was thinking about this uh, last week when New Zealand's Prime Minister, uh, in her response to the attack on the two mosques in Christchurch, spoke in these terms uh, when she ordered an inquiry into what the government could or should have known about the attackers. This quest to know for any number of good reasons um, is, uh, I think, at the heart, again, of many of our privacy debates. A knowing society, a, a society composed of known citizens, carried promises as well as perils. Techniques for making citizens knowable from credit reports and personality tests. Am I fading out? It's coming out. Yeah, okay. I'm oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Feel free to stop me. <laughs> Do you want me to use both? Yes. <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm at a press conference. That's <laughs> okay. Please just raise your hand if you're not hearing me, and I'll, I'll, we'll figure that out. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, I was about to say that a knowing society uh, carried promises, that is, as well as perils. Um, techniques for making citizens knowable, uh, whether credit reports or personality tests, wiretaps, CCTV cameras, could offer opportunity and security to some, but being known too well through the monitoring of one's physical movements or purchasing history, for example, uh, could also threaten uh, personal autonomy. It's really important, I think, to recognize that citizens could suffer from too much privacy uh, as well as too little, which makes the topic uh, even more fascinating to me. Uh, that is, uh, it was sometimes a harm uh, if, students, if citizens felt that they were not able to be seen or heard or recognized uh, for who they truly were. This was just as bad as being exposed in some contexts. So for me, this has meant that the story of modern privacy is not simply uh, a tale of invasions and violations, surveillance and spying, which is sometimes, um, I think, how our um, 
our public conversation treats it. If individuals have sometimes sought to be anonymous or unknown, they have also wanted, uh, sometimes desperately, they've wanted to know and to be known, but just to be known on their own terms. Um, so this is the bundle of um, conceptual issues that I was, um, it took me a long time to work through <laughs> in writing and researching this book. Um, and now I want to move into some of this history um, and take you through some of the stories that really engaged me as I, um, as I did my research. So these tensions, these tensions between being uh, wanting to hide and being wanting and wanting to be known or wanting to know, uh, really emerged in force, I think, uh, more than a century ago, in the 1890s. Uh, and they were a product of the new media of the day, uh, which along with novel technologies and uh, new forms of social interaction, created new conditions of exposure. Now, it's worth saying that uh, prior to the Civil War, most Americans uh, seem to have understood privacy as closely linked to property rights, uh, to their immediate physical surroundings. Um, Anglo-American law uh, discussed um, the, this concept in terms of a man's home is his castle, uh, and of course, um, that uh, description only applied to a small fraction of Americans in the 18th or 19th century, um, and yet that, uh, that legal concept um, summed up something important about the, the physical uh, and tangible understandings of what privacy was. Beginning in the late 19th century, however, the walls around one's home and private life seemed less solid for a number of reasons. And this was true even, and maybe especially, uh, for the elite white men who had counted on the protection of those sorts of walls around their privacy. New technologies uh, made communications faster and more convenient in this era, but also more porous and penetrable. Um, and in this way, the uh, resemblance uh, uh, to our time, uh, the 1890s and the early 21st century, um, the resemblances are really striking. Uh, these issues were raised uh, even by the innocent seeming arrival of the postcard, uh, which was first authorized for sale in New York City in 1873. Uh, Postcards were uh, enormously popular with consumers. They were inexpensive, they were an easy way to share news, and some 200,000 were reportedly purchased in the first two hours that they went on sale uh, in New York City. So a truly popular new uh, communications technology. Uh, however, their use seemed to compromise uh, the privacy of the males, uh, and also, uh, and just as importantly, uh, to alter the terms of disclosure. Uh, and you quickly find editorials and uh, etiquette guides scolding postcard writers for laying bare uh, their private affairs for anyone to see. Uh, so an early version of letting, thing, letting it all hang out, of not caring who saw uh, a mail carrier, a bellboy, uh, what, your, what were the contents of your private communications. Uh, far more uh, disruptive uh, than the postcard, however, were the telegraph cables and telephone lines stretching across the nation in the late 19th century, uh, both of them newly available uh, for commercial and personal use after the mid-1870s. Uh, both were vulnerable to interception um, by police and federal subpoena, uh, but also criminal activity, uh, and um, the new wires connecting the country would spawn, uh, in fact, a whole new genre of fiction, uh, the wire thriller, um, which um, investigated the thrill and the, um, the kind of mystery of people being able to tap into each other's supposedly private conversations. So you see here on the left one um, uh, illustration from The Wiretappers, an early 20th century fiction, uh, fictional account. Uh, and then on the right, uh, an early advertisement for American Telephone and Telegraph, where you see the operator literally reaching um, into individuals' homes and conversations. Uh, the telegraph network uh, entails storing and sharing personal communications in new ways. Uh, for this reason, one scholar has called the telegraph the Victorian internet um, because there were these messages stored in multiple locations um, and therefore um, uh, open to uh, investigation or reading by others. And state laws would arise uh, to ban wiretapping. Um, in one uh, state legislature, um, these bans were thought necessary, quote, to prevent the betrayal of private affairs for the promotion of private gain or the gratification of idle gossip. 
Likewise, uh, the introduction of the telephone unsettled prevailing norms around privacy, it allowed casual and unchaperoned conversations, so it afforded more privacy in one sense, but it also um, practically invited listening in, uh, whether by telephone operators or neighbors on shared party lines. So um, there was always uh, this other side of the coin, of course, a worry about privacy and exposure of private matters, but of course an eagerness um, from other parties to know um, and to pry and to reveal. Uh, the new telephone lines, um, to give you a sense of this resonance uh, with our present, uh, prompted one observer to charge that the telephone had ushered in, and this is a quotation, once and for all, an era of electronic exhibitionism and voyeurism. Um, so something that could have been said, probably has been said many times, right, about social media. Uh, but it was virtual invasions of a different kind, of the press and of the camera, that triggered the first modern calls for a right to privacy. Uh, one source uh, were the new broadsheets uh, that pried into matters previously sheltered from view, uh, the social affairs, divorces, and scandals of elites, uh, here you see a, a kind of um, satire of the new press, the daily scandalmonger, the morning cyclone of crime, um, this notion that the new press was, um, was grabbing a hold of a kind of voyeurism and um, period uh, curiosity in the public at large. Um, and uh, the camera is the other agent um, that I would, um, I would point to here. Um, and its possibilities for virtual invasion. Uh, as you likely know, uh, photography had once been slow and cumbersome. Uh, subjects had to sit for the camera. They could not be caught unawares. Uh, but the arrival of fast exposure times uh, and the so-called instantaneous photography of the 1880s would allow the taking of candid photos for the first time. Um, so you get um, this uh, uh, kind of swell of amateur uh, photography, but also surreptitious photography um, in the late 19th century, including advertisements for things like detective cameras, um, disguised cameras that look like other objects, um, so that you could carry them around and those around you would not know that you had a camera, a picture taking device. Um, so there are advertisements that you can find from the late 19th century for uh, cameras that are shaped like umbrellas or whiskey flasks or revolvers, <laughs> other kinds of objects, um, showing, I think, a kind of market uh, and a desire, uh, again, to be able to capture uh, images of others unaware. Uh, the first newspaper halftones also appeared in 1880, uh, which would open um, the floodgates for uh, the mass circulation of images. This made it cheap and easy to reproduce uh, photographs in print. Um, this traffic in images uh, will cause offense, and you can measure that in a number of different ways. Uh, there were regulations uh, pretty quickly placed on the use of cameras in the White House, for example, on <laughs> railroad lines, on ferries, and on private property. Um, you see in the popular press uh, the phrase, Kodak fiends arrive <laughs> and take off. Uh, it was an insult, and it entered the vernacular very quickly uh, for people overstepping a kind of line by taking someone's picture. Um, it was this combination of aggressive cameras and an aggressive press seeking new kinds of information about people that would lead two Boston lawyers, uh, Samuel Warren here on the left and Louis Brandeis on the right, uh, to call for a legal remedy, which they called um, the right to be left alone. In a Watershed article in the Harvard Law Review, they would endorse a right to privacy that went far beyond mere property rights by calling for a shield around something much less tangible, um, what they called the inviolable personality. Something internal, uh, something almost spiritual or psychological in nature. Um, the Boston lawyers were chiefly concerned, um, as men of a certain class, uh, about protecting um, people they would have called men of reputation. <coughs> But a right to be let alone uh, resonated widely uh, as a tool to combat unwanted exposure in an urban commercial culture. So it spread far beyond their class. Uh, in fact, some of the very first right to privacy cases, uh, suits uh, in uh, courts of law were brought by women 
uh, who, in the completely unregulated environment of the time, uh, were much more often uh, the object of surreptitious photography and images that would then circulate uh, for uh, profit, uh, would be bought, sold, and traded. Um, for example, in advertising campaigns for products, ranging from soap to cigarettes. Uh, one early case was Marian Manola, um, here on the left. Uh, she was a stage actress um, who was photographed in tights. Um, and she was, it was fine with her to wear tights in front of a theater-going crowd for a live performance. What she objected to uh, was that image circulating outside of the theater. And so she would bring suit uh, for the distribution of her image without her permission uh, within this um, new framework of a right to privacy. And in 1902, uh, in a New York case that made national headlines, Abigail Roberson, um, the woman whose profile you see on the right, uh, would lodge a similar kind of complaint against Franklin Mills' flower. Robeson cited the making of 25,000 lithographic prints, photographs, and likenesses of herself without her knowledge, which were then displayed in stores, saloons, and other public venues. Um, and in fact, uh, the sort of wonderful thing about her story is that she had only learned of the advertising campaign when she saw her own face on a neighbor's bag of flour. <laughs> Um, Roberson's initial legal victory uh, would speak to the offense that this new traffic in personal images uh, had caused. But the grounds on which a judge would overturn her victory were telling too, and I'm just going to read you his uh, rationale for why he thought she didn't have a right to privacy in this case. He dismissed uh, what he derided as the so-called right of privacy for its preposterous claim that a man has the right to pass through this world, if he wills, without having his picture published, his business enterprises discussed, his successful experiments written up for the benefit of others, or his eccentricities commented upon, either in handbills, circulars, catalogs, periodicals, or newspapers. This judge implied that in a mass-mediated world, a world in which information could be disseminated cheaply and easily, perhaps there was no rightful claim to a private identity. The questions that Roberson's lawsuit raised more than a century ago are ones that we are still asking. Um, who had the right to possess or consume or to circulate one's image? Did a person have a right to their reputation? And what, on the other side, of many Americans desire to know, whether in the name of entertainment, the flow of commerce, an informed citizenry, or a free press? In these century-old debates over telephone lines and circulating portraits, we find one origin point, I think, of our current dilemmas. But I want to turn uh, to a different kind of origin point, because I think uh, one of the things that's uh, vexing, um, but also really interesting about the history of privacy is that it is both a story of continuity, that is the image, the photographed face, for example, um, has been central to many of our privacy debates since the late 19th century. But there are other ways in which our debates about privacy have changed um, quite dramatically. And so I want to I wanna turn to that now. So a different set of concerns about the known citizen would be sparked by the expanding administrative state. So here I move from private actors to um, federal state actors. Uh, and this time, uh, the debate was centered not on publicity or exposure or reputation, but instead on the problem of identification or tracking. Uh, the United States uh, would be late to the documenting of identity compared to its European counterparts. Here are just a few images of fingerprinting. Uh, but modern states uh, required reliable proofs of identity, and such documents were becoming a, a fact of life slowly uh, in the 20th century, whether in the form of birth certificates, passports, or proposals by the Federal Bureau of Investigation for universal fingerprinting. Now, that last, uh, the federal, uh, the FBI proposal for universal fingerprinting um, will be dashed by popular protests. But in other ways, citizens were becoming much more easily tracked in the 20th century. And one of the most interesting examples to me, uh, because it was inadvertent, uh, was the 1935 passage of Social Security. Um, enacted during the Great Depression to provide old age and employment benefits, um, Social Security would become, um, you know, as we know it today, um, the best uh, sort of identifier of American 
workers um, that we have, uh, at best extent uh, identifier we've got. Uh, Social Security entailed keeping track of specific individuals' um, lifetime working record, and here are just some of the publicity documents that the, um, the Social Security Board put out to accustom people to this way of tracking. Um, and it really was an unprecedented state project. Uh, in fact, the new Social Security Board determined that there was no building in Washington, D.C. that was large enough or strong enough for the new agency and all of its files on U.S. workers. Uh, and so, um, as probably lots of people here know, uh, the agency was housed in Baltimore in a former uh, Coca-Cola bottling plant. You can see that um, there at the top of the photograph there um, for its first 20-some um, years. Um, the byproduct of Social Security uh, was, of course, the issuing of unique identifying numbers to workers, the SSN. And Social Security numbers would immediately raise questions about the possibility of tracking troublesome employees and union members. Many others also worried who would have access to sensitive details about workers' age, address, marital status, race, and even health. Um, here you see uh, the early uh, filing system for Social Security. Um, in fact, there were other problems that Social Security uh, unleashed, um, including an early form of identity theft by 1937. And there would be a, a smattering of political protests that would break out about having to, quote unquote, register with the government. <coughs> Um, and you see that here, uh, especially in uh, Republican, um, uh, the Republican uh, National Committee's opposition to Social Security, partly on the grounds of this idea of registration with the government. And they warned of uh, mandatory dog tags and having to pull out a little metal um, tag with your number on it whenever asked by a state official. Um, so, um, so there is there is this sense and sensitivity uh, to registering to identification um, in the 1930s. But for most, uh, economic security seemed to outweigh the specter of one's work and financial history being known to the state. Um, and to my surprise, I went to the Social Security Archives looking for that. Uh, Americans seemed to quickly accommodate themselves to being numbered and to being known. Um, here's an ad from the Chicago Defender, African-American newspaper, um, showing a free lifetime gift for you, protection, a bronze plate with your own social security number on it. Uh, the social security number became, for some, uh, a proud badge of inclusion and identity, uh, even something to broadcast to others, uh, to um, have engraved on a bronze plate or a brass tag uh, or a decorative plaque that you would display um, in your home. This was especially evident um, in the African-American press, uh, partly because of the exclusion of black workers from many of Social Security's programs, um, but it was uh, broader than that. Uh, in fact, if you start looking in uh, popular magazines, newspapers of the 1930s and 40s, a booming market emerges for um, similar Social Security plaques, plates, luggage tags, wallets, and other trinkets displaying one's Social Security number. Um, some people have rings uh, and other jewelry uh, imprinted with their number. Uh, here you see a really personalized ring for men and women, um, the Social Security birthright ring, and it's, or birth uh, stone ring, and it's got the number, as you can see, right on its face. Um, lots of stories of people also uh, engraving their number on their dentures. Um, so I think that was more so that you would always have it available. Um, but um, others went further. Uh, permanently inking their social security number on their thighs, their backs, or their biceps in what newspapers heralded as a boon for the tattoo industry. And in fact, you can find tattoo proprietors um, thanking FDR, writing to him, um, <laughs> thanking him for the uptick in business because uh, some of them were getting up to 10 to 20 new customers a day uh, so that they uh, could have their social security number um, imprinted on their bodies. This is a famous photograph by Dorothea Lang, the great uh, depression photographer. And you can see, maybe those of you in the back can't, but uh, those in the front can, um, this man has his social security number on his bicep. And what he could not have anticipated, of course, in 1937, when this photograph was taken out in the fields of Oregon, was that because the number is visible, we can know exactly who this man was, how old he was, when he died, when he lived, where he lived, Thomas Cave from Oregon. Um, these social security number tokens, uh, jewelry, and tattoos suggest many Americans' willingness in years of depression and war to be known to the federal government as visible citizens. 
Certainly, as I mentioned, some were alarmed by the tentacles of the state reaching more deeply into their personal affairs. But in an age of expanding social benefits, social welfare, the prospect of being unidentifiable could be the greater fear. In the 1930s and 1940s, that is, personal data and identifying details were not yet fully private matters. But this would change, uh, and it would change pretty swiftly, actually, in the mid-1960s. Um, and this was largely because of three developments that I'm just going to sketch real quickly. Uh, one uh, political, one cultural, and one technological. Uh, the first was uh, the growing distrust of um, authorities of all kinds uh, by the mid-60s, um, state and non-state entities. Um, invasions by the state were more visible uh, following McCarthyism, the FBI surveillance of sub subversives, uh, all kinds of exposés of improper gatekeeping and discrimination by federal agencies and so forth. Um, and um, you can get a little bit of a sense of that here, I think, the eavesdroppers, the FBI nobody knows, and so on, the kinds of agents of society that were watching people, and perhaps not watching with good intent. Um, there's also in this period a mounting fear of virtual invasions, um, and particularly psychological invasions, uh, coming from the growth of psychological expertise uh, throughout the society, and I just show uh, as a stand-in um, the kind of um, fear of uh, subliminal advertising in the late 50s and the early 60s, but we could think about other things, uh, psychological experiments, corporate personality tests, motivational research and marketing, um, all of which will lead to new claims uh, for psychological privacy, spaces in the interior of the person that should be out of reach of um, the society at large. Uh, and finally, uh, the technological uh, motor here was really the spread of computerization, as we might expect. Uh, but the fears of powerful new machines, computers, with memories that could not be erased. Um, and so you see a scholarly, a popular, and a political and regulatory kind of debate around what is to be done about all those records being computerized by the 1970s. So what you see by the 19, early 1970s is a decisive pivot to concerns um, about privacy that are centered on personal data. Not on, again, exposure or publicity or even psychological invasions, but about these identifying details. Um, it's worth noting that most Americans up until this point had paid very little attention to the information about them steadily mounting in the society's files. But in the mid-1960s, the existence of record-keeping systems on private citizens, um, systems that were not at all new, uh, would burst into political debate. Student records um, are a case in point. Uh, before about 1970, the behavioral reports and psychological tests and disciplinary records and the like that routinely wound up in US public school filing cabinets firmly belonged uh, to teachers and to administrators. They did not belong to students or parents. But those kinds of records, uh, alongside those of credit bureaus, police departments, and social welfare agencies, um, largely in the bureaucratic background, would now become objects of controversy. Um, and in this way, um, information that once belonged to corporations or schools or the government or science uh, was being re-envisioned as personal property and new rights were devised to gain access. Um, so it's um, in the early 70s that you get a swell of new legislation and regulation around these kinds of data. Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA, uh, and it's parallel in laws like the Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1970 and the Privacy Act of 1974. Uh, all of this legislation promised citizens access to their files, uh, albeit through a pretty cumbersome bureaucratic process, for the first time. Um, and just uh, a decade early, earlier, really, uh, this kind of admittance to official records would have been unimaginable. So there's something new uh, going on here. And I just want to point out that this is not just an erosion of privacy. This is a kind of redefinition of what counts as private matter. Um, all of this will, of course, uh, place the social security number in a new light. Um, this is a New York cartoon from this past year. Uh, right? The worst possible graffiti, revenge graffiti, one could um, imagine would be one's social security number out there for all to view. Um, and in a Pew survey of 2014, 
um, the social security number ranked the list of uh, those uh, responding as the most private fact um, about them, or the most um, risky private fact about them. Uh, these uh, new kinds of legislation on drawing boundaries around this kind of personal information endorsed individuals' claim to possession of their virtual selves, uh, those little bits of biography that were distributed across the society's filing systems. Um, and in that way, personal data will gain new status and protections in the 1970s, just as did the notion of an inviolate personality in the 1890s. So that is not, of course, the end of the story either, however, um, because at the very same time, uh, the very contents of what Americans considered to be private was a moving target and would always be a moving target, I suppose, in a knowing society. Just as the social security number was becoming more private, closely guarded secrets, whether sexual, emotional, or autobiographical, or medical, uh, were moving out into the open. Influenced by political scandals, the Vietnam War, therapeutic culture, and second wave feminism, many uh, in the 1970s clamored for transparency, and in fact an end to secrets in law, politics, and private life. And so you see in this same period the unmasking of politicians' affairs or the new norm of lawmakers' voluntary disclosure of their tax returns, um, at least most of them. <laughs> um, the fact that some behaviors were being destigmatized uh, and there were new calls for authenticity uh, were helping um, to break down, that is, the wall between uh, one's public and private persona. In important ways, uh, that wall between public and private had really um, remained intact since the late 19th century, and this really is changing uh, quite rapidly in the 1970s. So just one example, um, after Watergate, uh, Betty Ford uh, very deliberately um, uh, uh, unlooses uh, frank revelations about her medical procedures, and particularly um, her mastectomy, um, allows herself to be photographed in the hospital for the national press, um, when only a decade or so earlier, neither the word breast nor cancer could be printed in the newspaper. Hmm. By the 1980s and 1990s, a legacy of some of this, uh, the impulse to disclose one's shameful secrets was apparent in tell-all talk shows, in the outing of gay public figures and celebrities, and in the publishing phenomenon of the 1990s, the personal memoir. And this is just one origin point for that, uh, the 1973 series, um, An American Family, the first uh, reality television show in which uh, PBS cameras set up in an American family's um, home in Santa Barbara, California, and started the cameras running on their lives. Um, all of this, oh, and Donahue, of course, um, all of this provoked a new kind of concern that what was left of privacy in American life would be undone by the arrival of a confessional culture. Uh, social media would only cement the case uh, for many commentators that privacy, if it had been there, was gone. Uh, another New Yorker cartoon, what was the point of writing a blog that nobody else could read? Um, that's the daughter's <laughs> reaction to her mother finding a diary in an attic. Um, in a shift that would have baffled the lawyers who had first called for a right to privacy, critics began to argue that even more worrisome than improper prying by the media or the state was the voluntary outflow of personal matters into public places. By the end of the century, some concluded that there was no longer any privacy in the United States, nor even any desire for it. And yet, as we know, privacy talk erupted once more in our own time, uh, triggered by NSA spying, big data, and startling exposés of just how well corporations and the state could know individual citizens. So we often hear these days uh, that privacy in America has all but vanished, that it has either been wrested away by uh, a powerful state and corporate agents, or uh, that it's been given away by a population that just doesn't care enough about it. I think this longer history of snapshots, social security numbers, and school files tells a different story. Privacy, I would argue, has not in any simple way been lost. Instead, uh, it's shape-shifted alongside cameras and fingerprints, data banks, and talk shows. Rather, it has been accumulated episodes and decisions in many different domains 
that made the gathering, sharing, trading, and mining of knowledge about us reasonable in the moment. The cumulative effect of those decisions only visible in the longer run. <coughs> At the same time, once associated with property rights, physical space, and social privilege, claims to privacy, in fact, expanded over the last century to encompass one's image and personality, one's inner self and psychological freedom, one's official records and digital identity. This longer view helps us see that privacy is neither a measurable thing nor even a quality that is eroding, but rather a dynamic and ongoing skirmish over the claims of modern social life. And it poses questions about the risks of record keeping, the costs of convenience, and the seductions of security that we, as known citizens, will no doubt be grappling with for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. So hopefully you all know the rules. Please wait for the microphone to reach you. Please use the microphone when you get it. We are recording this for uh, posting uh, at the Wilson Center at the National History Center's website. Uh, and if you could identify yourself before you begin to speak, we'd appreciate that as well. So, let me take co-chair's prerogative. So if I could actually have the next 45 minutes, <laughs> I would have so many questions for you uh, about this absolutely eminently readable book that is both profound and fun to read. You can't always put those, those words together, but you've got so many different stories and you cover so much chronological ground. But one thing that occurred to me by the end <clears throat> has to do with the very word or the concept itself and its definition. And you say that the term you know, morphs and shape shifts, but it also seems to me that people mean very different things by the concept of privacy. And so um, with the multiple meanings, you know, if you take, let's say, Griswold v. Connecticut or Roe v. Wade, that's a particular meaning of privacy. Um, if you're talking about Donahue and Oprah to Facebook, the confessional culture that you talk about, that's a different kind of of privacy. And even if I, say, went on uh, Oprah today, I still wouldn't want anyone to know my social security number. You know, that's off limits or any of my credit uh, information. And for those who think uh, privacy doesn't exist, uh, FERPA, uh, the federal law pertaining to, to educational records, that's kind of sacrosanct. Uh, and as an administrator, I'm grateful for it every time a parent calls wanting to know how their kid is doing. It's like, I can't tell you. <laughs> FERPA forbids me from speaking to you about this. So I just wonder um, whether we're talking about the same, I mean, you cover this ground in the book, but, but in the larger <coughs> scheme of things, if we're really talking about many different things when we're talking about privacy, and perhaps it's unfair to put so much weight on one term that means different things to different people. Yeah, well, Eric, that's a great question, and it's one that um, I obviously uh, wrestled with a lot, and in some ways it's the most vexing question of the whole thing, because um, I was drawn to write about privacy in part because of its capaciousness, and because it seemed like it was doing very different things in very different domains, um, and yet Americans use the same word uh, for this thing that can apply to one's psyche, to one's personal space, to one's intimate relations, to one's uh, reproductive rights, to on and on. And it seemed to me that rather than parcel it out or to write a history that was only attentive to one of those meanings, it would be interesting, and um, ultimately I found this to be true, but also frustrating and bewildering to try to write about them all and to kind of weave them together to think about what it was that, um, that made this such a live term, a, char a charismatic term, in American public culture. So um, you're right, of course, uh, that privacy means something different in these different contexts. Um, but there was enough, um, I think, connecting uh, for me uh, these different episodes and domains to make me think that actually they did belong together. And I would, I would describe, I guess, my own definition, my own working term, um, for privacy would be the line between society and citizen and where, where people place that over time. 
Um, and that each of these episodes and in each of these domains, that was what was at issue. Um, now, public attention migrated from one place to another, and that was really interesting to see and allows, I think, a kind of chronological history where um, particular places uh, are at issue in the late 19th century, whereas you start to move to things like data or bodies or psyches at different periods. And that, um, tracking that kind of attention to privacy and what privacy, where privacy debates were most live was a way to tell uh, a biography, if you will, of the term. But, um, but I would never say that it is a, a clean term or one that I, uh, in the end, was able to master. I think it's a, a kind of masterless term in American public culture, but that's what makes it really interesting to use to think about the society that developed across the last century. Thank you. Eric, open question. Perhaps Shaiman as well. I, uh, I also love the, um, uh, the presentation. Fascinating, uh, fascinating story. Um, lots of questions as well. Let me just um, follow sort of on, on Eric's conceptual deconstruction here. Ask you to talk a little bit about the sources for mm -hmm. the book, mm -hmm. um, and you, you you know you come at a term from different perspectives. So I trust that there are different uh, types of sources that inform this study. And secondly, since we're at the Woodrow Wilson International Center, yeah. to what extent is this an American story and an American exceptional understanding? <coughs> privacy and if you could just sort of place it a little bit in a, in a global or international context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. So on the sources question, um, this, uh, when I began this book, um, it was clear to me that there was no archive for privacy. Well, there would be if one were writing a history of a particular legal strain or a jurisprudential tradition or something like that. Um, or a civil liberties fight or something like that. There, there would be archives for any of those. Uh, but what was going to be necessary for a book that really tried to be faithful to um, Americans' understandings of privacy and how they shifted, you'd have to start poking around in a lot of places and just and um, be led a little bit by uh, your nose <laughs> or my nose. Um, I think anybody um, who gets into this territory realizes that there's some there's a lot of um, there's a lot of one's own interests in what you wind up following. Um, and so I would never suggest that this is a um, definitive history of privacy. It's just the first round. But, um, but the sources that I was drawn to um, were sources that allowed me to see uh, how debates unfolded, how conceptual matters got kind of rejiggered through debate, um, how regulations changed understandings of what uh, people were entitled to. Um, how new technologies uh, and media um, changed the borders that people felt were around them and who could cross them and who couldn't. So I was looking for those moments of transformation. Um, and so it led me to use really quite disparate sources in every chapter of the book from um, federal administrative sources um, as at the Social Security Bureau to a lot of popular culture materials when thinking about Cold War worries about um, domestic space um, and a lot of social scientific kind of work and papers and thinking about um, new subjects rights and subjects privacy rights um, when thinking about scientific experimentation and so forth in the uh, 1960s and 1970s. Um, some legal documents for sure. There's a chapter here on uh, Griswold and the strange terms of reproductive privacy law um, and, um, and then uh, some kind of um, archives of social movements, um, grassroots protests and so forth around things like um, educational uh, records access. So um, very disparate kinds of source bases for every chapter, which um, was exhausting but also really interesting to think about how to then tie them all uh, to one another. So that's, that's the answer I guess I would give to sources. It's a very eclectic source base um, and many different um, kind of actual and um, invented archives. Um, and then the, the question about American exceptionalism is interesting. I, I think when I began this project, I imagined it might be possible to tell a story about um, American privacy that, that um, put it in conversation with other international um, privacy debates. Um, and there are moments where that was possible. The 1970s is a clear moment of isomorphism where many uh, Western industrial nations are grappling with this problem computerization and computerized records, for example. And so you get a kind of, you get international conferences and um, some kind of stability around things like fair information practices. Um, but what I, 
became persuaded of more and more, and it goes against many of the trends in our um, profession, I think, was that it was very hard to tell this as a transnational story, given the kind of things that I was interested in. And it made me realize how actually nationally specific um, many, uh, many of our privacy conversations are. Even if technology and communication circuits are, are of course creating similar dilemmas in different polities at the same time, the, the ways that Americans talked about privacy was in its own register um, and also had much to do, of course, with national and state-specific laws and policies and regulations. And so I don't think I would have been able to give that larger and much more complex story justice, but I hope that the book will invite that and allow for some kind of um, comparative and um, transnational approaches to thinking about how different um, national cultures dealt differently with similar kinds of um, emerging problems. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's open up, Dave. Thank you, it's really fascinating. Dane Kennedy, National History Center and NGW. Um, two questions, kind of related very briefly. One of them has to do with the relationship between privacy and anonymity. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it, and it strikes me, you start your story in the late 19th century, which is also the point at which urbanization becomes an important dimension of American history as well as immigration. And I'm wondering to what degree that figures into this story. And the other is just, what about the U.S. Census? <laughs> what about the U.S. Census? <laughs> yeah, uh, great question. Um, so let me say, maybe begin with the privacy and anonymity question, because I think there's a, there's a Privacy and anonymity are not the same thing, mm -hmm. but there are moments where they're closer together and further apart that I or would be that, that charting that would be its own really interesting history, I think. Um, because one, um, one explanation for the rise of new kinds of privacy talk in the late 19th century is precisely that the new cities were enabling a kind of anonymity that had not existed for most Americans before. Um, Edward Schills, the great sociologist, calls the middle, sort of the middle of the 19th century through the 1870s, the great kind of, the golden age of privacy for this reason, that people were becoming unloosed from their small, nosy, invasive <laughs> village communities and moving into urban spaces where they were not, um, where they were not known, um, right, in the same way. Um, and if you follow that out, um, you could argue, as some have, some sociologists have, that in fact it was precisely the anonymity of the cities that created the new need <laughs> to track and know people in new ways. Um, so Stephen Knock makes this argument um, that a society of strangers, um, in order in order to create mechanisms of trust, not also needed to know people in certain ways, different ways than they were known in the old village communities and um, small, tight-knit family uh, groups and so forth, um, but in, in ways that would make social life um, possible and would sort of lubricate uh, transactions, financial and otherwise. So I think urbanization and these questions um, are, are absolutely uh, connected um, and in really important ways, uh, and that um, this concept of a society of strangers is, um, is a pretty useful and evocative one for thinking about why it was both necessary and alarming to have um, new ways of prying into people's lives in these dense urban settings. Um, it was exactly the promise of anonymity that was gonna be compromised um, by um, the telephone wires and wiretaps and um, the press and, and uh, also public health um, mm -hmm. uh, surveys um, where I was astonished to learn, I don't know if there are any public health historians in the room, but that you know um, names uh, first and last of uh, victims of various kinds of um, contagious epidemics, you know, were posted <laughs> publicly um, in um, American cities to try to chart paths of disease, for example. Um, so, so at any rate, that's a long answer to the, my sense of that these are very connected. And then the U.S. Census um, uh, produced, uh, you know, every ten years new debates over what the U.S. government could know or what an agency of the U.S. government could know about um, its uh, population. Um, and um, so episodically, these questions would come up um, uh, pretty much every 10 years in new ways as the census form changed and as um, uh, Americans uh, became, households became newly sensitive to different kinds of information. 
Um, so, uh, but there are moments when that they really seem to um, explode these questions. One of them is right around the same point where I began in 1890, um, and the questions there about, um, particularly about uh, health um, and uh, income, I think it is, um, that really um, set, actually create census protests. Um, and non-compliance um, and refusal to answer in much larger numbers than there have been before. And then there have been other moments of that beyond that. But did that answer your question mm -hmm. about the census? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in the far back. Uh, related to the census question, you are? Oh, I'm Jim Sang and I'm No, no anonymity here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be uh, related recorded. to the census question, as you pointed out, as Eric pointed out, the privacy is a somewhat amorphous word. And one interesting thing in the last decade has been an effort to quantize privacy. And the census now, in fact, has accept, accepted the idea of uh, Cynthia Dwork and her colleagues of differential yeah. privacy. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder whether um, that will clarify things or confuse <laughs> things. It, it, it's actually more related to anonymity, but, your ability, but the idea of privacy as your ability to, or inability to guess a yeah. correct answer. Yeah. How do those concepts affect this whole debate? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. Um, and it brings me back to something I had meant to say to, um, to Dane's question before about anonymity. I mean, I think it's actually really, we're in a, again in a moment right now where I think privacy and anonymity are lining up in some interesting <coughs> ways, or where privacy is being redefined as anonymity, as Privacy is, um, you know, in one one way of thinking about it, is everything that can't be, you know, mined or grabbed about you from the various traces that you've left in the society, which is, you know, to one way of thinking, a pretty impoverished uh, understanding of what privacy might be, <laughs> but is, um, but is maybe a kind of pragmatic definition. You know, what, what what can't be known about me is one way of thinking about what privacy is, right? But. Um, but I do think both attempts to quantify and to commodify, right, to put a market price on privacy, which there have been some experiments around this, are, um, I don't know if I would say they're clarifying. They are um, taking a very complex, rich, vexed set of issues that, as Eric pointed out, have you know many different meanings in different contexts and, and cut in different ways in different contexts and trying to, to simplify them which is always a useful, ex it always tells us something, but I don't think it can tell us probably in some ways what we most want to know, which is what do we, how do we preserve some sense of moving through a force field of a society that wants to know as much as it can about us to whether to um, promote our safety or to profit from us or to um, you know, whatever it is. How do we preserve some sense if we think it's important as a society of our, um, um, I don't know, some borders around um, the person? Um, so I don't know. That's probably not a very satisfying answer to what you've asked. But I do, I mean, I do think the way that, that legal scholars and others have been pushed to think uh, about privacy because of the kind of algorithmic term, I do think there's a lot that is coming out of that that's really interesting about um, how um, automated decision-making and bias are being transformed by new technological instruments and we need a social um, philosophy as well as a set of values to um, understand and make sense of that and make decisions about that. So I think in that sense th that's very clarifying. But whether we're going to get to some sort of um, answer to what privacy is um, from those measures I'm not so sure. Yes. Uh, Steve Lipson, Vanderbilt. Uh, a lot of your talk focused on uh, the public and their different perceptions of when is too much. Like, we're waiting for privacy or we don't care. And so I was wondering, like, is there any similar debate on the other side, like among corporations, the government, the media? Uh, like, has there actually historically always been, yes, more information is better? Or have there been cases where some of those people who might still privacy were thinking, you yeah, know, maybe this is too much, or too much information is bad? Uh, and the second question is, uh, when you hear about, like, nowadays, we hear about, like, young people, the younger generations who don't care about privacy. Uh, so I was wondering, like, if historically, like, in terms of, like, are there demographics or other, or, like, age or other demographics that should we indicate which people have been traditionally more concerned about privacy? Mm -hmm. um, again, 
wonderful questions. Let me take the second one first. Um, you know, uh, one way of thinking about it, I don't mean this to sound as uh, <laughs> Um, trait as it might, but that teenagers might be, you know, at all times <laughs> the most concerned about their privacy, uh, even though people actually don't think that's true today, or at least that's not the dominant narrative, but um, but young people, right, separating from their families in some ways are those who have, uh, at least uh, since the early 20th century, probably been some most concerned about privacy. But, you know, uh, what's, what's fascinating about studying the history of um, movements around privacy and uh, different, the, the clear and um, clearly uneven uh, doling out of privacy and privacy rights to Americans across the last century and a half or so is that those people most deprived of privacy are often um, the ones who have been treated as least in need of um, privacy, right? So people with the most privacy t typically have been um, the ones that have been listened to uh, in terms of uh, granting greater privacy rights. I think I'm making this more abstract than I mean it to be. But it's all, all, only to say that um, right, th the disenfranchised of American society have always been granted fewer privacy rights um, than have others, um, whether that's poor people, institutionalized people, young people, non-citizens, African Americans, and other ethnic minorities, uh, the, not those of non-normative sexualities. Um, and, um, uh, and so that the, the ways of arguing for privacy for those groups has often been different than those in the kind of presumed mainstream. Um, your question about um, whether the information collectors uh, have ever been um, wanted to put the brakes on information collecting I think is a really interesting one. Um, and one that I don't know that, that I or anyone uh, that I know has spent maybe enough time thinking about. Um, right, there is this sense that there are these voracious parties out there just wanting more information and that the breaks are going to come from social movements or from public resistance or from, you know, intrepid exposés or something like that. But I do think, you know, there, there are one uh, cases that come to mind of places that collect a lot of information that don't use it. Um, <coughs> I mean, actually, the census is a good example of that, but also, so uh, until recently, until really the 1970s or 80s was the case of credit bureaus that had a huge amount of information about um, their clients that they did not try to monetize in a way that we now know as Equifax and so forth. I mean, they existed as credit bureaus, but they didn't try to sell or model that information until quite recently. Um, so, and in fact, didn't really even realize the riches uh, that they were sitting on um, in um, in their uh, you know kind of in their books uh, and in their databanks. So, um, whether there are groups that have argued that too much information is bad, I mean, you can see a kind of self-regulation in some government agencies, I suppose, but. Um, uh, I would say for private agencies, it's hard, it's, I'm a little hard pressed, or a private company, I'm a little hard pressed to come up with examples. Of <laughs> <laughs> examples where um, a, there was a kind of um, self policing or self monitoring of, um, at least in recent history, when information has come to be seen as such a valuable commodity, of um, you know deciding we're not, we're just not going to collect that because it's not. Nice, <laughs> or it's not doesn't seem seemly, right? I mean, if the opposite has been true. There's been a kind of pushing of that envelope. So, well, thank you. Could I follow up on this? It occurs to me: Is there, Stanley, have you thought about the relationship, if there is any, between privacy on the one hand and secrecy on the other? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the you know, as as the citizen became more known, mm -hmm. government became mm -hmm. more secret, less known, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. same goes for private you know, mm -hmm. corporations. Mm -hmm. well, is there, is there, what's the connection there? Yeah, well, you remind me of something that I meant to say to Steve's question, which is, of course, privacy has been invoked when it's the corporation's own interest or the government's own interest in the, in the realm of state secrets or um, right, intellectual property or uh, trade secrets and so forth. So that, but that's not, but you know, that's not about their clients' uh, privacy. Um, so that, I think there's another and a different story there. But your question was about really the, um, the connection between secrecy and privacy. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are examples we can think of where secrecy is highly prized by very powerful institutions in the society. They, and, you know, I keep getting this kind of uh, folk story from people who work in um, 
Silicon Valley that um, you know the people who protect their privacy most carefully <laughs> you know are people who work for Google and Facebook and so forth right because they understand what the infrastructure is that we're living in um, but um, but there are other ways I think in which privacy and secrecy relate to each other in really interesting ways I mean one one um, episode that I trace in this book is the way that privacy became um, for many gay liberationists, for many feminists, a kind of cover story, a power story for uh, keeping secrets uh, that protected the powerful. And so there is a movement to, to undo those secrets um, in lots of different ways. Um, the, the secret of you know, domestic violence, say, or of um, abuse, um, child abuse, and, and so forth. So, um, on the other hand, you know, there are secrets um, that people keep that, um, about practices that are, at least at the moment, perfectly legal, that uh, suggest that secrecy can be about um, stigma as much as about choice. And I'm thinking of um, a recent book um, about uh, abortion that really takes up this issue really interestingly, that abortion is something that mo you know, many people do not talk about, even though it's a legal and a constitutional right. Um, and that's not necessarily about privacy, it's more about stigma. And it's more about a secrecy born of, or a privacy born of stigma rather than um, choice to keep certain kinds of boundaries um, fixed as you wish. So I think that, that was helpful for me in thinking about the relationship too between secrecy and privacy. But obviously the secrecy of a woman deciding not to tell anyone she's had an abortion is different than a state secret or a trade secret. So there are lots of different kinds of secrets, I suppose, um, that we could be talking about. Yep. Yep, you're welcome. Uh, Richard Coleman, uh, CBP, retired. Um, with big data and artificial intelligence and the weaponizing of information for political and whatever, uh, it seems like the individual citizen has a choice mm -hmm. to either use a credit card <laughs> or use a social media mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And that use equals consent, right. which seems to me the big umbrella that uh, the yeah. Facebook and whatever, that's their business yeah. model. Yeah. Uh, is that legally penetrable? Mm. Or, I mean, are we stuck with that commitment to letting the market mm -hmm. people get all the information they need to better their marketing? Right, great question. Uh, I'm so glad you raised the issue of consent because I think there is this legal fiction of, um, consent that people by using something are agreeing to the terms. And in fact they are, I mean in some very thin sense because uh, to sign on to any of these websites you're signing on to a privacy policy and clicking a button. Um, there was there was a, uh, I can't remember, was it an economist or what field the person was in, but someone who did a study um, a few years back of how much time it would take <laughs> to actually read all the privacy policies. That, that, yeah, that, yeah, first to read, they didn't tackle the more complex issue of understanding, but just to read the privacy policies that all of us, or almost all of us, have signed. Um, and it was, you know, it was not in a matter of hours, it was in a matter of weeks <laughs> of one's life. Um, on an annual basis to keep up with uh, reading this. So, so no, they are not meant to be penetrable. They are meant to be obscure. They are meant to um, frustrate you so that you will just give away whatever um, uh, kind of consent rights that you have so that you can move on to buying or, or doing what, what you will. Um, so I think what, I, what I'm interested in is that I think recently um, there has been a lot of really good um, kind of legal scholarship on this failed consent regime. I mean, people are calling it that, but it is not, in fact, um, uh, what it says it is. And a lot of new um, scholarship uh, that is trying, sort of trying to rethink what that could mean and, and what consent means in this setting, um, where to use the platforms of daily life you are um, uh, in ways that you don't fully understand, um, trading away, allowing someone to commodify uh, and, and commoditize your information. So um, that's not a solution yet, but I do think the problem has been named, and it is. Um, and th I think there's almost nobody who believes that the kind of privacy policies that we have currently um, are doing what they say that they're doing. Um, they're really just a a tool to allow more commerce to happen, right? I mean, that's what they, that's what they are. Um, so uh, someone described uh, this as a, he talks about it as a, um, 
a walled garden where you know we are seeing better and better, but we can't see the people who see us. And I think that's a very it's a nice um, description of what's what's happened. Um, so you know, I, I, as a historian, you know, looking back um, at the past 150 years, there are not that many moments where it seems like the the um, needle really moves on privacy issues in a way. There are these bursts. Um, in the 1890s and maybe in the kind of 1920s, 1930s, and then again in the 1960s. But I do think we're in the midst of one now. I mean, I, I do think there's probably more attention to these issues and more thinking going towards solving them and more energy around these issues than there has been probably since the, um, the mid-1970s. So I think some things will result from that. Um, and it, it will have to be better than transparency, uh, access rules for data and um, consent policies or privacy policies that we've got now. Sonia, Michelle. Hi, Sonia Michelle from the University of Maryland. Um, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about privacy. It's really a matter of where knowledge is lodged and who has access to it. So knowledge in one place is secrecy, knowledge in another place is publicity. So I was thinking about blackmail. And I was thinking about your 1890 uh, turning point, and I was just reading the novel Circe by Madeline Miller, which oh, is about, yeah, that's great. about yeah. mythology, mythology. And, yeah. and in it, Circe actually blackmails that's Helios, right. yeah. which is a very odd thing. But yeah. So I wonder if, if, you know, if that's come into your story at all. Yeah. And the other, the other thought that occurs to me is that, you know, I think you used the phrase hunger for knowledge at the beginning of your talk, and I was thinking the more we know, the more we need to know. So for example, when Freud begins to understand the psyche, we, then, then you know, he needs to know. We need to. His patients need to provide him with more information yeah. so he can you yeah. know, work his way, his wiles on it. So I just wonder, you know, how you know there's a dynamic there between the more we know, the more we need to, the more we need to know. Yeah. So, so I'm talk for a moment more about to say a few words more about the novel you were reading, just so. What? Here. Talk, talk for a moment about the novel you were referring to. Oh, it's called Circe by Madeline Miller, and it's a ba it's based on. Uh, and, and the Odyssey, actually, but it's told from the perspective of, of Circe, one of the female characters, and it's sort of the personal life of all of it. I mean, she just in, imagines what it was like to be these, all these figures in, in the ancient world. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we should stop talking about my book and start talking about that, because it's, great, it's a great novel. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so gripping and compelling. Um, but yeah, there is this blackmail story in it, and um, and you're right. I mean, there's this issue of I mean to talk about privacy without thinking about who is the invader and who is the um, the you know knower um, and or the multiple knowers. Of course, one of the our current dilemmas is that we don't know who knows us, right? I mean, I think that's the unsettling piece to a lot of our discussions about um, big data, you know, what do these algorithms know that we don't know, or why do these ads pop up? You know, who who is you know what is the the um, chain by which we start getting advertisements immediately for things that we've been, you know, we thought we were searching just by ourselves. Uh, and um, so there's this, which, you know, we don't, we know that that's not the way things work, but we imagine that, um, and we depend on that in some ways. But the, um, this, the question of who the knower is, and I like how you put it, where knowledge is lodged uh, and who has access to it, is really interesting because sometimes the, um, you know, it really matters who knows, and sometimes it matters only that you don't know who knows, and sometimes it matters that, um, uh, you know, that everyone could know it, even if they won't, and even if they will never act on it. So, I, so I think that's that's really helpful to me at hearing you put it that way. Um, and I do not write. I wish I had uh, written about blackmail <laughs> in this book, but there there are lots of other moments where you see some some secret being used by someone that it was not intended for. Um, and that spiraling out in, and having kinds of, you know, consequences that were not anticipated. And the possibility of that happening is what leads to certain kinds of regulatory or legal or kind of rights-based claims. Not that it has always happened, but the very possibility. And that's what changes, I think, in interesting ways are new networks of communication, of interception, of, um, uh, redistribution uh, and so forth that, that make those fears, even again, if they don't happen to someone individually, make them possible to think, um, which is, which is um, I think, really interesting. And, and you, there was something else I wanted to say to you, and I've now forgotten um, oh, what it was. <laughs> but it was about the last point, I think, that you... The hunger um, for knowledge. The oh, the hunger, oh, yeah, thank you, yeah. The hunger for knowledge driving more. 
One of the things I got really interested, as you might have been able to tell, in um, the social security kind of um, database, really, that emerges. And one of the things that's so interesting there is that the moment, even people who have resisted and fought against social security, the moment that there are those files and they exist, you see all kinds of parties trying to get into that information. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's, I think it's a week after Social Security Board um, is, has got its files, you know, in order that banks, that the FBI, that, um, you know, are, are wanting to find out information about specific people, and they had no means of doing so before, or, or not as direct a means of doing so before. There is this appetite that seems to have been there, but is also mobilized and created by the knowledge that there are all these files now on American workers. Um, and it allows new possibilities. It allows new things to be done. And so I think some of that is the almost intellectual move um, of being able to see that new things are possible. Um, amazing, I mean, um, uh, domestic um, disputes and missing people. All kinds of people start knocking on Social Security's doors, draft deserters, um, you know, trying to find them through Social Security files. <coughs> And so the existence allows those kinds of questions, allows people to say, why don't we know? Uh, you know, why don't we have better records? And so it does, I, there is a kind of perpetual, perpetuating um, cycle there. Yeah. Uh, Rich Stites, I'm uh, retired from the State Department here. I, I was really interested to hear that you were talking about 1890s as a watershed. <coughs> Yeah, it seems to be that 1990 is a real watershed too, because yeah. that's the World Wide Web, right? Yeah. yeah and yeah. so you have these models of these companies like Facebook, which basically you volunteer your information. What have a billion members? I think a lot of members, and then they commoditize that that yeah. information. But also, it means that anybody anywhere in the world can steal that information now. I mean, basically, you can have a North Korean take your social security number just as well as a 15 year old German kid you know, playing around on the mm -hmm. internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really changed the, the nature of, of what's available, of, of, mm -hmm. of how you share your information or, or how your yeah, information yeah, can be yeah. shared. Yeah. That's right, yeah. And maybe, I don't know, the, um, maybe even a little later than the 1990s, because it's, it, you know, I think the, um, I mean, how you periodize it, I'm not quite sure, but um, but social media and the kind of the kind of information, right, that's being loaded, the kind of social media 2.0, it seems to be really important for what you're describing, which is a shift, and it's a really important one. Dana Boyd uh, writes about this. Dana Boyd, um, in her ethnographies of teen um, social media users, the the change from a kind of um, uh, presumption that it's difficult to um, in share information to one in which it's more difficult not to share yeah. information. And that that is what happens with the kind of creation of the second sort of wave of social media, or the second wave of um, the internet, basically. And that to, that, that is really critical, because people were not used to thinking that way, that, that it was so easy to share and disseminate and re, and send and steal and yeah that that used to be really hard to get information and it's become all too easy so I think so I think you're right that that is another I don't know exactly where I would date that but that's a really important kind of shift that occurs because of a new um, communications platform and there are precedents of course I mean the telegraph and the telephone allowed certain kinds of messages to be intercepted in new ways and across new kinds of um, uh, distances, for example, um, but um, but we're in a whole new territory, <laughs> obviously. No. Gentleman, the blue shirt there in the back. Uh, my name is Corey Jensen. I'm a, a high school teacher from Utah, and um, my question stems from a, a couple of different perspectives. One is seeing the youth, um, where they may take a uh, a picture. Uh, of a friend or, or someone, an enemy, and it's taken out of context, and then that picture is shared, and they're then presented with a misidentity. Yeah. Um, and, and this stems also from uh, working uh, at a, uh, a law firm in the past where people have had errors made on their credit reports, yeah. Yeah. and, and their, therefore their identity is now something that it is not. And, and to me, it reminds me of almost like a tabloid type um, magazine. Or some a picture is taken, and now this is your identity, and this is the presentation. I was wondering if you could speak mm -hmm. along those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's well. Your um, <coughs> your mentioning of the, the sort of 
pictures and the traffic and pictures just um, it makes me want to underline that this kind of the personal image um, has such an interesting and long connection to kind of debates over privacy, you know, and um, to the, the ways that that image gets shared or used or, as you say, sort of misidentified or mislocated uh, is, um, has prompted many um, uh, kinds of debates and dilemmas around privacy. I mean, such that, as I was mentioning in the talk, you know, a lot of the early right to privacy suits are about um, people suing for being for advertising a product that they did not endorse, you know? Um, so exactly this issue that you're raising. Um, and one of the first state statues of the right to privacy came from a man who was pictured in an insurance advertisement. And he said, I've never, you know, <laughs> supported this insurance company in my life. And um, this idea that you, that something is compromised, right, by you, you being identified or, or grouped or understood in this way, much like a tabloid photograph, you know, takes you out of one context and puts you in another. So I, I think that's really right. Um, I wanted to speak to your, your um, point about errors, because it's not simply that information is being collected, it's this risk of a problem developing, right? Of something happening where your credit report is, um, you know, unbeknownst to you, um, is inaccurate and then stops you from being able to get a loan or being able to rent an apartment or, or whatever it is. Um, so this, so I'm, I think it's really interesting that that's not just a, um, a matter of um, worrying about something being collected. It's about how it's being collected and who has the ability to change, to know what's in that record and to change it if it's inaccurate. So I think there's a whole bundle of issues th that I think, you know, may Ex help explain why the very first federal privacy law in the United States was um, the Fair Credit um, Reporting Act because it was so important. That was that hit people right where they, you know, right where it hurt, you know, because they couldn't know their their credit records were absolutely closed to them, and there were these incredibly shady practices going on in credit agencies about the kind of information they collected, about the veracity of that information about agents making stuff up because they needed to find bad stuff, you know, and include it in their reports and querying neighbors and, and so forth. Um, and um, that information then became lodged in a record that was really powerful and had a lot of um, uh, determinative weight for someone's future. And so, so I think that's why um, the, um, these issues came to a head actually first in 1970 with credit and then moved to other kinds of record uh, keeping. But the er yeah, the errors are not to be <coughs> underestimated. And the, the problem that of, the, of a bureaucratic life, right, that if something gets um, put into a record um, that's not correct, it's very, very hard to undo that. People in the 70s talked about this as the record prison. I mean, not only that, not only inaccurate information, but that accurate information could trap someone. Um, and this sense that um, that this had not been anticipated, that people could be trapped almost by their own traces. Great, we're just about out of time. I don't know if there, well, anybody, why don't we take a final quick round of very short questions for some very short answers. So do you sir, <coughs> all the way in the back. And anyone else that I'm overlooking here? Over here. Over here? Yeah. All right, we'll go. Brief questions, please. To what extent does the drive to make public matters of personal autonomy, like sexual orientation, whether someone has had an abortion, to what extent does that drive make it increasingly difficult to categorize these rights of personal autonomy under the rubric of privacy? Thank you. All the way in the back there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter Giardi, independent analyst. Um, <clears throat> just a few words uh, to end this on the future, what you have uh, come across in your research beyond biometrics, facial recognition, and uh, with the gentleman mentioning earlier, big data and AI, a future super composite on each individual. Thank you. And then finally, the gentleman over there. Hi, Helen Adele from Smithsonian. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, related to the first question, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the sort of history and development of the distinction between public and private uh, rights, whether it's for libel or for you know, politicians about uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Small questions. <laughs> small questions and one minute to answer them. <laughs> All right. Um, my voice is going to make it to the end. Um, boy, uh, thank you for those great questions. And sorry to be long winded on some earlier um, answers so that I'm going to have to be very brief here. Um, I love the question about private matters sort of entering the public sphere and whether those. Uh, that those kinds of claims for personal autonomy can be understood anymore as claims to privacy because there's a really rich and interesting history about that. You know, the one thing I will say is that I think there has been a lot of legal thinking about this question and whether actually these claims should be brought under the heading of freedom or liberty rather than privacy. And in fact, the liberty claims um, have been working better for people than the privacy claims as privacy jurisprudence has kind of become more cramped in recent um, years. Um, so, um, so that's all I'll say, although I can say more. Um, on the future, um, I was reminded of Isaac Asimov. He has this great um, essay in the 70s about um, hope, the, the promise of everybody having an individual identifier number that would um, totally personalize every person so that every advertisement would be tailored to them exactly. And I'm struck by how much science fiction um, uh, actually opened the way or predicted or helped us see um, in ways that seemed outlandish at the time where we were headed. And so um, maybe I would say we should be reading <laughs> our uh, science fiction and, and seeing where, where it goes. I think that um, you know, really live debates right now about sort of automated um, intelligence and algorithms and um, data mining are, um, are really important uh, food for thought about where we are headed next. But that's, that's, all, I can, that's all I can do with that question at this moment. Um, and the private public line, I mean, that's a whole, yeah, I mean, a whole, such a huge uh, question for political philosophy and, um, and, and how that line has, um, has moved and been reinvented over time is one thing for just the time period I was looking at from the 1890s to the present, I was really trying to think about and, um, and, uh, and uh, draw and redraw along with my actors, along with these known citizens. So I, I hope there's something in that book that might help uh, answer that question. <laughs> And on that note, we unfortunately have to draw this to a close. However, if you can't get enough of the Washington History Seminar, we've got not one, but two sessions coming up this week uh, and next. Uh, so, Robert Jervis, this coming Thursday, several days from now, April 4th, speaks on his new collection, How Statesmen Think, The Psychology of International Politics, and on our traditional Monday, next uh, April 8th, Jennifer Miller will be talking on Cold War democracy, the United States and Japan. I want to thank those of you who participated in our seminar today. And of course, thanks to Sarah Eichel.